Okay, thank you. Okay. So let me begin by summarizing what we have learned yesterday. So we took a pair of punctures, take a pair of punctures. with local coordinates w and w prime and then we sort them together using w w prime equal to minus q okay. and these pair of punctures could either be on the same Riemann surface or different Riemann surface does it matter? Same or so this produces a new surface. So this gives a new surface. On the other hand, for correlation function, this is achieved by inserting a certain quantity okay, inserting the following object. We had phi s of zero. So I put the r first. Phi r of zero. Phi s of zero. Then phi r c. Phi s c. And then minus q to the h s. Q bar to the h s bar. Okay, where H S and H S bar are the L zero are the conformal weights of phi S, okay, which is the same as the conformal weight of phi S C or phi R C. And these, even though I have written both as zero, okay, so these are used, yeah, inserted using the corresponding local coordinate system. So this is in W coordinates, and this is in W prime coordinates. Okay, so they are not really at the same position. It's just that in the W coordinate, it's at W equal to zero. In W prime coordinate, it's at W prime equal to zero. Okay. So this relates the correlation function on the new Riemann surface to the correlation function on the original Riemann surfaces. Okay. And then we said that using this repeated application of this, application, can give the correlation function on any Riemann surface. Okay, because the higher genus Riemann surface you can build by sewing together handles on uh, the uh, sewing together punctures on a sphere. Okay, if you take a sphere and you sew together n pairs of punctures, you basically add n handles. Okay, so this becomes a, a, a genus and Riemann surface. Okay. So this is an in principle construction. In practice, when you actually want to calculate the correlation function on the Riemann surface, there are other tricks. In practice, one can combine this. with analyticity, okay, because there are various holomorphic fields and operator polar expansion to find closed form expression. But 
the point is that in principle you can just use the sewing procedure to build up the all build up all the correlation functions okay. and this also says something else that the all correlators are obtained from knowledge of conformal weights and sphere three point function. Because you can start with sphere three point function and then start showing functions to build spheres with a, large, a larger number of uh, punctures and then you can start showing punctures on the same uh, sphere to build up the higher genus correlation functions. Okay. The control weights are needed because as you can see in the power formula that we had, okay, you do need the information about the control weights of the basic states. So this procedure is called plumbing fixture. The procedure of sewing that we describe it's often known referred to as the plumbing fixture. Okay. It's like connecting the two punctures by a pipe. Okay, by a, you are just adding a hand. Now we have to check for consistency. Okay, so let me explain where the consistency requirements come from. That often what happens at the same Riemann surface, it punctures. may be built from sphere three point function in more than one way. So I'll just give an example. Okay. Take, for example, a sphere with four punctures. Okay, so you have four punctures, one, two, three, four. Okay. And suppose you want to build this out of um, sewing a sphere, two spheres with three punctures each. Okay. Now this we can do in two different ways. Okay, you can see easily one, is that you can cut open a circle here. Okay, think of this as the, the third puncture. Okay. So you are showing a sphere with one, two, and a puncture that will be sold, and three, four, and the puncture that will be sold. So that this is that so you can build the four point function that way. Okay. Or you can cut open here and sew together a sphere with two, four, and a puncture, and one, three, and a puncture. And the question is, are these, do these give the same answer? Similarly, for a torus one point function, okay, that's another example. Take a one point function on the torus. And you can ask how can we think of this as a sphere with so you can clearly see that for a one point function, you can get from starting with a sphere three point function and then showing two of the punctures of the sphere by hand by uh, uh, this plumbing fixture. But again, this can be opened up in two different ways. We can either cut open this circle 
Okay, so it should be clear what it means that you are just uh, joining together like this. The other way is uh, perhaps not so uh, visible from the diagram, okay, but uh, the other way is that you can cut open along a circle like this. Okay. Now, even though it doesn't look like a, a plumbing fixture of a sphere, you can easily convince yourself that it is. Okay. And the simplest way to convince yourself is that there is a symmetry on the torus that exchanges the two cycles. Okay, So if this is one way of uh, getting the torus, this should also be another way of getting the torus. Okay. And again, the question is, do these different ways give the same answer? Okay. So this, in fact, okay, this consistency, okay, is part of the consistency requirement of CFT. Okay, so if this fails, if these two procedures don't give the same answer, okay, then we declare that the correspond the underlying CFT is not a consistent CFT. Okay. So this is uh, known as crossing symmetry. This is known as modular invariance. Okay, these are just names for these consistency checks. Okay. So it's clear that in principle. There are infinite number of such consistency checks. Because given a higher genus surface, you can cut open in so many ways. Okay, and each of those should give the same answer. So there are infinite number of consistency checks. Okay, so this would seem to imply there are the infinite number of constraints. So number of constraints is infinite. Okay. Fortunately, there is a very useful result, okay, which says that as long as sphere four point function and torus one point function are consistent all higher genus correlation functions are also consistent So you don't really need to check uh, infinite number of constraints. Okay, all you have to do is to check that the theory has crossing symmetry and modular invariance. Okay, now let me give an example, uh, uh, an exercise. So exercise prove that on a genus G Riemann surface. We need total host number minus six G minus six to get a non zero correlator. Okay. And the hint. Okay, is that you have to use plumbing fixture to build these genus G correlation functions. And you use the fact that the ghost number of phi R C ghost number of phi R C is six minus ghost number of phi R. Okay, that follows from this relation that phi R C phi S 
equal to delta R S. Okay, so if phi R C and phi R are the same, then there is a non-zero inner product, but that requires that the sum of the those numbers must uh, add up to six. This is on the sphere, of course. Okay. And this together with the plumbing fixture can be used to prove this general result. Okay, so these are leave as an exercise. Okay, so this tells us that in principle we can define genus correlation functions for conformal field theory. Okay. But now let's ask the question okay, that you are, are interested in string theory. Okay. So why are you interested in correlation function of higher genus surfaces? In Correlation function on higher genus surfaces. And the answer is the following. So I'll give the first the intuitive answer, okay, and the intuitive understanding of this, and then we'll make it more precise. Okay. So the answer is that a G loop. Amplitude in string theory in string theory is expressed in terms of CFT correlators. On genus the surface. Okay. And hopefully by the end of today, we'll see the explicit expression for this G loop amplitude. Okay. But first, let me just give an intuitive understanding. Okay, and this will be based on some example. So take, so example one, take a one loop, four point amplitude in QFT. Okay. So what kind of Feynman diagram? So let's draw a Feynman diagram. Okay, the Feynman diagram is of this kind. Okay, this is one particular example. Okay. Now these crosses I'll explain. Okay. So what I'm computing here is what we call amputated Feynman diagram, amputated amplitude, okay. <coughs> where I've <coughs> removed the external legs. Okay, because that's what enters the expression for this matrix. Okay. So I remove the external leg, legs and where the external leg first connects to the Feynman diagram, I just uh, uh, represent by a cross. So now let's see intuitively what it will become in um, string theory. Okay. So essentially in string theory, we, we expect that all these internal lines will fatten into cylinders, okay, if it's closed string, because a string wall sheet is a cylinder instead of being a line. Okay, so these will fatten into closed strings. Okay. So it will become, so we fatten, internal lines okay and let's see what it becomes so it becomes a diagram like this my drawing is not going to be very good but let me I'll at least try to explain okay so you think of this as a pipe I mean, it's not okay so these you should think of as pipes. Okay, so it's like a donut. Okay, and you have these four points where the external lines join. Okay. So you see that this is already a genus one. Okay, that torus four point, it looks like a four point correlation function on a torus. Okay. So this looks like 
four point function on torus. Okay, but we are going to eventually translate this into a precise expression. Okay, the, um, but right now I'm just giving the intuition. Okay, that why we expect the one loop amplitude to be related to genus one uh, correlation function. Okay, I'm going to describe one more example. The two loop three point function. So let me draw a diagram. This is a possible Feynman diagram, right? Okay. Again, the convention is that this is where the external legs are attaching, okay, which I'm not, I'm not going to draw. Okay. And now you fatten it. So if we fatten it, it becomes something like this. Okay, again, each of these wants to think of really as pipes. And then you have the usual four, three other points where the external lines attach to the surface. Okay. So this now looks like a genus two three point function. So this is the reason we expect that a G loop amplitude in string theory should be given in terms of some uh, genus G correlation function. Okay. But now we have to ask what is a precise dictionary? Okay. So we need to know what is a precise dictionary. So there are two sides to this dick study. So let me explain what these two sides are. So the first one is what is computed. Normally you think of the CFT as giving the string S matrix, but as I'll discuss in detail, okay, what it gives directly is not the string S matrix. You have to do a little more work to extract the string S matrix. Okay. But whatever it gives is can be used to extract the S matrix. Okay, but you know, you know, before we can say how to extract the S matrix, we need to know what exactly has been computed. Okay, only then you will know how, how to relate to S matrix. Okay. So this I'm going to state in the QFT language. Okay, that if you are doing a QFT, what would be what does it correspond? What is that, the quantity that you are computing? Okay. And then the second part is how is it computed? Computed using CFT correlators. So first, let me try to answer the first question. Okay, what is computed? So what is naturally computed in terms of CFT correlators is the following. Okay. What we compute is an off-shell off Green's function with Three level, let me state this more clearly. 
with external three level propagators in it. So this is not quite the amputated amplitude that you are familiar with in QFT. Okay, so like in terms of Feynman diagrams, I'll explain what, what it is what is being computed. Okay. So suppose we let's think in terms of QFT. Okay, even though we are doing string theory, but we would want to know what in QFT would it correspond. Okay. So imagine that you have a QFT Feynman diagram like this. Then what we'll compute, so this is, we, the, we think of this as a, uh, a Green's function, okay. not uh, necessarily on cell uh, external states. And what we'll compute in, uh, what we'll compute in string theory is the quantity where you just remove this one over k square plus m square factors from the external lines. Okay, so this is like amputated at Green's function. But suppose we also have a diagram like this. Okay, let's take a diagram like this. Then the quantity that I'll compute, okay, will correspond to removing the three level external propagators, which means these, 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 and these. But this part of the diagram will be included. Okay, so it's not quite the amputated Green's function that you are familiar with in quantum field theory. And so on. But given this, okay, suppose we know how to compute this. Then we can compute, we can consider the full Green's functions because of course the three level propagators, we know what they are. Right. So you can always multiply the uh, what we compute by this one over k square plus m square factors. Okay. So this can be used to get the full Green's function. Okay. And then we can apply LSZ to get the S matrix. Okay. So that's the fully systematic procedure for extracting S matrix of string theory from conformal field theory. I'll tell you in this, in part B, I'll have to tell you how to use conformal field theory to calculate these objects. Are there questions? Is this clear? What we are, I'm saying here? Okay, now, if we are working with three amplitudes, then you can easily convince yourself that what we are describing here Okay. is precisely amputated Green's function. Right? Because in three amplitude, of course, you don't have diagrams like this. <clears throat> and there, if you take the external states to be on shell, you'll get S matrix. Right? So normally when you say that the uh, uh, CFT correlation functions can be used to calculate the string S matrix, okay. we specifically refer to three level and there it's true. The CFT correlators directly give the S matrix. Okay. Sometimes in the for loop amplitudes, also the CFT correlators give S matrix. And that happens provided diagrams like these are automatically zero. And in some supersymmetric theories, it does happen. With theories with a lot of supersymmetry, one can argue that the two-point functions vanish. Okay, so there is no self-energy uh, diagram that uh, is involved. Okay. And there again, okay, removing these external tree-level propagators give you the amputated Green's function. And if you put the external states on cell, you'll get the S matrix. So when you say that string, that the CFT can compute the S matrix directly, it's only in these special cases. Okay, either at tree level or with sufficient, with uh, theory with sufficient amount of supersymmetry, okay, so that the external, uh, these diagrams are absent okay, from the beginning. But in general, if you want to compute S matrix from CFT correlation functions, you have to go over this route. So the sum of diagrams like this, I'll call the amplitude. Okay, even though it's not an usual terminology. Okay. So this will be called amplitude. 
Okay, so when he, I say that we'll be writing down the expression for the amplitude, okay, this is what it will be. Okay. And then you have to take that amplitude okay, with option external states okay, and then convert this into S matrix using the standard LSD procedure. Okay, now let me describe what you mean by off shell string state. Definition of off shell string state. And this will be as follows. So this is by that will be by definition a state V in the CFT, in the CFT, satisfying B0 minus on B equal to zero and L0 minus on B equal to zero, okay. but not necessarily, not necessarily Q beyond B equal to zero. Okay. So this one we will regard as the on-shell condition. Okay. So when you say that you are going to give the prescription for computing an off-shell amplitude with uh, some external string states, we'll be basically considering external states beyond V2 up to Vn, if it's an endpoint amplitude, each of which satisfies this condition, these two conditions. Okay, and some of them may satisfy this condition, but it's not necessary. Because if it does satisfy this condition, we'll call them on shell extra distance. So now we want to ask how to compute, what to compute, or how to compute, the amplitude as a function of the V1 to Vn. Okay. And this will be the rest of today's lecture. Okay. Exactly what is the formula for this A? So to do this, we'll begin with a general description of Riemann circuits. So the claim, which I'm going to illustrate in the next page okay, by drawing diagrams, is that this can be regarded as a union of N disks one around each puncture. and 2G minus two plus N spheres each with three holes and they'll be joined at along three G minus three plus two N circuits. 
So we'll denote the disks by DA. Okay, with A equal to one to N. Spheres by SI, I equal to one to 2G minus two plus N. And circles by CS with S equal to one to 3G minus three plus two N. And these circles are essentially, these are essentially the intersection of two spheres or a sphere with a disk. So these can be either SI intersection SJ or SI intersection D. This seems somewhat abstract, but I'm going to draw the figure, draw an example of a figure in the next page where everything should become clear. Okay, so the example that I'll be considering is G equal to two, N equal to two. So let's draw a genus two surface. And let's suppose that we have two punctures, one here, one there. So now let's start drawing the circles, okay, which will divide the disks and spheres. So around each puncture, there is a disk. So let me draw those disks. Okay. So in interior of this is what I'm calling D1, interior of this is what I'm going to call D2. Then we have to divide this into spheres with three holes. So let's draw some holes, some circles. So let's label. So D1, D2 have already labeled. So this is the first sphere. Okay, you can see that this has a topology of a sphere with one hole here, one hole here, one hole there. This is the second, this is third, and this is the fourth sphere. Now, how many circles are there? Here is C1, C2, C3. C4, C5, C6, and C7. Okay. So let's now see if the counting matches. Okay, so what I had claimed earlier is that the number of spheres, number of disks to put the number of paths, that's two. The number of spheres was 2G minus two plus N. Okay. So how much should that be? So G equal to two, right? So that's four minus two is two plus two, that's four. And indeed there are four spheres, one, two, three, four. And number of circles is 3G minus three plus two N. So that's six minus three is three and two N is four, so that's seven. And indeed, we can see there are seven circles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So this is just an example, but this is uh, generally true. Okay, you can convince yourself that any genus G Riemann surface with uh, N punctures has this feature, that it can be divided into disks, spheres, disks and spheres, okay, and separated by these many circles. Now on a circle, okay, maybe I should, 
Okay, are there questions on this? Is it clear? Now let's pick, fix some orientation on each circle. Okay, this is arbitrary. So once you have fixed the orientation, we call sigma s the coordinate on the left of the circle. So sigma x s will correspond to, oh, I should have, sorry, I maybe let that. Let me go back a little bit. Okay. So introduce coordinate system. Complex coordinate system ws sorry wa on the disk with wa equal to 0 being the puncture okay that's the way we'll choose our coordinate system otherwise we leave it arbitrary okay. and zi on si okay on each sphere you can choose complex coordinate zi okay so you call that zi okay. some arbitrary coordinates now we go back this we call sigma s is a coordinate on the left of cs Okay. So this could be either ZI or WA. Depending on what is there on the left of CS. Okay. Left is well defined because I have already fixed some orientation on CS. Okay. The final result doesn't depend on the orientation. Okay. So sigma S is the coordinate on the left of CS, okay, which could be either ZI or WA. And tau S could be the coordinate on the right of CS, which again could be ZI or W. And in general, specifying the Riemann surface means that specifying the relationship between sigma S and tau S. So tau S is equal to FS sigma S. Okay, this is what we call the uh, transition function. Okay, as you go from one coordinate patch to the next coordinate patch, so it always is some function of sigma s. Okay. And specifying all the FSS basically specifies the Riemann surface combination. Okay. But of course, there's a lot of redundancy. Okay, which I'm going to describe in the next slide. So consider the equivalence class. Consider, okay, let me write it this way. So if you take a function, a set of functions, fs of tau s, one for each circle, okay, take the collection of these functions. This is considered equivalent to say f s tilde of tau s a different set of functions okay. if they can be related okay. 
by coordinate transformation of the form z i goes to some arbitrary function of z i, okay, which should be one to one in, on the on the si. Okay, outside it doesn't matter, okay. and which means uh, uh, there can be singularities inside the holes. Okay, because the holes are not part of si. And W A going to some H tilde A of W A, okay. but we impose the condition that H tilde of zero, A of zero, is zero, okay. which means that the these coordinates, the transformations, do not change the, the location of the puncture. Okay. The puncture is uh, kept at uh, the origin in the new W coordinate system. So this defines an equivalence class. Okay, so the space of equivalence classes of equivalence classes is finite dimensional okay precisely it's six g minus six plus two n dimensional this is real dimension. And known as the moduli space of genus G. Everyone's surface with n punctures. Okay, so um, um, inequivalent Riemann surfaces with punctures are related by are those which cannot be related for which these transition functions cannot be related to each other by coordinate transformations of this kind. Okay. If this condition was not there, then the dimension will be reduced further by two n. Okay, and there, in fact, we have. The uh, that will be the moduli space of genus G Riemann surface in lower punctures because the location of the information about the, about the punctures essentially comes to this information that we only allow coordinate transformations okay, that do not move the punctures. Okay, so that okay, restricts the set of uh, allowed coordinate transformations and hence increases the dimension of the moduli space. Okay. So finally, the uh, amplitude okay, will be expressed as an integral over this space. Okay, but we have to understand what the integral is. Okay, but ultimately it will be expressed as an integral over this space. So I let me give this space a name. Okay, so we'll call this we'll call this moduli space as M G N. Okay, genus G one surface with n punctures. Now we are going to introduce another space, okay, which is infinite dimensional. So introduce another space. PGN. So this is equivalence classes of these fs, these functions under trans coordinate transformation. Z i goes to H i of Z i. Okay. So you allow arbitrary coordinate transformation okay, on the spheres, but you don't allow the coordinate transformation on the uh, disks. So this is what we call PGN. Okay. So what PGN contains, so physically, PGN 
contains information oh i uh, made a mistake okay i have to correct this okay there is something i have to add here and w a goes to e to the i alpha a times w a where alpha a are arbitrary constants okay so we define these equivalence classes so we don't allow coordinate transformation on w a okay except phase rotation okay you have to if two sets of fss are related by phase rotation of w a we declare them to be equivalent okay this is necessary okay so now let me say physically what this is so physically egn contains information about mgn okay the point in the modular space and choice of local coordinate at the function okay so in other words okay, if you make an arbitrary parameter parameterization of w right so w wa goes to some function of wa okay. then that is changing the local coordinate system around the function okay. and that is considered as a different point in pgn because pgn a point in pgn has a fixed set of choice of local coordinate system okay a different choice in point in pgn will have different uh, choice of local coordinate system okay so if you have the same model right okay but different choice of local coordinate systems okay so if you think in terms of the example on the sphere okay imagine that on the sphere you have fixed the locations of the uh, punctures okay so that fixes where in the modulized space you are in okay but you still have a choice of changing the local coordinate system around each puncture okay and that information is in pgn okay. so pictorially one can represent pgn as a fiber bundle so pgn can be regarded as a fiber bundle with base mgn and fiber containing choice of local coordinates okay so pictorially if you draw so this is the picture of pgn okay. so pgn is the whole total space okay mgn is this base space okay and if you go vertically up this direction okay this means that you have kept the the point in the modular space fixed okay a fixed genus one surface with a um, fixed set of punctures okay but you are changing the choice of local coordinate system at different punctures okay so this is the direction in which the local coordinates change okay. so pgn is infinite dimensional intuitively it should be clear is infinite dimensional since it has information about in independent functions that is 
choice of local coordinates. Okay, but up to phase. If we just change the phase of the local coordinate, it's considered as the same point in PGN. Okay. If there are questions, please ask at this stage. Okay, so let me introduce some formal notation Tm, okay, which I'll also denote as a vector T, okay, is are the coordinates on PGM. Okay, there are of course infinite number of them. Infinite number of coordinates. Okay, fortunately, when you actually do, do actual computation, you don't have to deal with this infinite number of coordinates, but right now let's take introduce a full infinite set of coordinates. Okay. So this means that given the point T, given T, T, we have a given, we are given Okay, I'm now going to put the T in the argument of Fs because changing T will change the function Fs. Okay, that's what I, one means, right? Because uh, uh, different choice of functions Fs correspond to different points in PGN. Okay, so that's why I have put the T inside Fs. Okay. Given set of functions Fs, but of course Fs is not unique. Okay, this is, it's not unique because it's not unique. since it can be changed by zi parameterization or wa goes t to the i alpha a times wa okay. but just pick some representative okay pick some representative Fs. Okay, so that's our I write Fs of tau S and T. So let me remind you what Fs was. Fs was relating the coordinate, the complex coordinate on the left of Cs to the complex coordinate on the right of Cs, that is T tau S. Okay, so so far, it's only properties of Riemann surface. Okay, we have not yet talked about the CFT anywhere. Okay. Now we are going to bring in the CFT. So we are going to define a CFT operator. Okay. Now operator I put in quotes. Okay. Because as we discussed that uh, CFT on a hard genus Riemann surface doesn't really have a full Hilbert space interpretation. Okay. But I call it operator only in the sense that we know how to calculate its correlation functions. Okay. So whenever I am talking about CFT operator, we should think of this as being eventually putting the put inside a correlation function. Okay. So the CFT operator that we will define is this BM, capital BM which is sum over S, S runs over all the CS, right? 3G minus 3 plus 2N objects. So let me write 1, 2, 3G minus 3 plus 2N.
Okay. So when I write D sigma is, this is B evaluated in the sigma is coordinate system. That's the notation you have been using all through. Right? So the argument also tells us what coordinate system we are using to uh, level to insert B. Okay. This derivative okay, is taken at fixed hours. Okay, we take the derivative of fs with respect to tm at fixed hours. So that's the definition of the operator P, pm. Okay, I hope it's clear. Now let's suppose that we have a set of off cell string states. Sorry, I have a question. Why is that operator a CFT operator? Because that is B. B is part of CFT, right? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, so that's that's the reason why it's a CFT operator. So it, it, it will make sense only inside a correlation box. Okay, and we'll soon put this B inside a correlation box. Okay, we are going to define a P form for arbitrary P. P is an arbitrary integer okay, on PGN, and this will depend on the um, some of the fixed set of external off cell states, which are denoted by P on to PN. Okay. And here is the definition. I'm going to use a different color. So omega P G N P on to PN is. These B's are the ones I defined just earlier, V on to Vn, sigma Gn. So I have to explain what the sigma gn is. So sigma gn is a genus g Riemann surface with n punctures. N punctures. And given choice of local coordinates at punctures, determine, determine by the point at PGN. Okay. So let me explain what the, this means. Okay. So you see, this is a, this is supposed to be a form on PGN. Okay. So it's a form, it's clear, right? Because you have the wedge product of, a, of a DTM on to DTMP, so this is a P form. Okay. But this, a form on PGN, of course, will depend on the particular point at which uh, we are computing the form. 
Okay. So where does that that uh, does that information go in? Okay, the point at which you are uh, computing the form. That information is in sigma g n. Okay, so sigma g n is a Riemann surface. Okay, corresponding to a particular model. Like that information is certainly there in p g n, but it also comes with its own choice of local coordinate system at the punctures because p g n contains that information as well. Okay, as you go vertically up in p g n, you will change the local coordinate system. Okay. And these vi's, the v on to vn, the vortex operator that we have introduced here, okay, these are inserted using the local coordinate system. Okay, so this is this uses this one is at w one equal to zero. Okay. Similarly, this one is at w n equal to zero. Okay, using the w n coordinate system. Okay. So in other words, if you fix the point in the modulized space and if you change the local coordinates that means if you go up the fiber along the fiber direction okay, this will still change okay for an off-shell state because the local coordinate system changes so this is the abstract definition of a form in pgn is this clear the definition Uh, yes, but excuse me, can we have an intuition what this form is doing? Well, we'll do an example of a four point function. Okay, we'll uh, sphere four point function using this form. Okay, and there it will become clear. This will be this will basically be the form that you have to integrate over the modulized space to compute string amplitudes. All right, thank you. Okay. Now, let me just say state a few uh, nice properties and later on we'll dis discuss other properties. Okay. So that first is that this description is manifestly invariant. under change of coordinate in PGL. Namely, okay. if you take Ti to some function of T, the form remains manifestly invariant. And you can see this easily because you see that when you change T to some function of T, these of course change, it changes by F prime of T uh, dt okay. but if you look at the remember the definition of b the definition of b has this del del t okay. so the combination that appears here is really the del fs del tm times dtm <coughs> and that is in uh, independent of the of any parameters of t okay manifestly del fs del tm times dtm is uh, manifestly uh, invariant under the parameters of t so it doesn't really matter what kind of coordinate system you choose Other useful information is that if we want to pull back pull back this form omega g and t on some p dimensional subspace. of pgn because after all if a b form is supposed to be integrated over a good p dimensional subspace right so eventually you'll be interested in pulling it back on some p dimensional subspace so if you want to pull it uh, uh, pull it back on some p dimensional subspace okay, with intrinsic coordinates you want to u p then the result is obtained simply by replacing tm by u by 
UIs. Okay, now there are if you suppose you are not interested in computing the form everywhere, okay, but just it's pull back on some p-dimensional subspace. Okay, you label this p-dimensional subspace by some coord set of coordinates you want to up. Okay, then for this b, you define the corresponding uh, uh, component using u. Okay, so you take the derivative with respect to uk here, del del uk and del del uk, okay. and here you contract with duk. Okay, so here you will have some du one to the up okay and that's what will be the pullback right this again you can uh, uh, convince yourself easily okay, by using this structure that the actual combination that appears okay, is this derivative with respect to tm times dtm okay so you can easily by chain rule you can easily convert this into derivative with respect to u times um okay if you are on a you know, p dimensional subspace okay. so we'll be eventually computing these pullbacks okay that's what is necessary will be necessary and for that, this uh, information is useful. Uh, what does the P signify, this integer P? Okay, right now, the integer P can be anything, okay? But ultimately, for actual physical string amplitudes, okay, we'll be interested in P equal to 6 G minus 6 plus 2 Okay. But defining this for general P is useful, as we'll see, because uh, that way we can uh, go up and down. We'll, we'll see some applications okay, of why uh, defined P's are useful. Okay. But uh, string amplitudes will be expressed in terms of a P form, where P is 6G minus 6 plus 2N, because that's the dimension of the moduli space. Is this clear? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so now we are ready to define the amplitude, off-cell amplitude. So definition of off-cell amplitude. So the step one is to choose a section SGN of PGN. Okay, so section means that you choose some section. Okay, so this was our PGN. This is PGN, and here is MGN. Okay, so the section has the same dimensionality as MGN. Okay, that's 6G minus 6 plus RPN. Now, the definition of the of A. So A, if you want to be an is integral SGN. Maybe I should write down the coupling constant first. Okay, so there is a string coupling constant, GS that I'm going to introduce. Okay, arbitrary con dimensionless constant. GS to the power 2G minus 2 plus N integral SGN. Omega G N Okay, so it's the P form, the general P form. We take the six G minus six plus two N form and then we integrate over this section. That's the definition of the amplitude. So from this amplitude. As I have already said, three level S matrix is directly the amplitude. In fact, more precisely, it's I times A. Okay, I is the standard I that comes from the Euclidean to Lorentzian rotation. Okay, so this you know, that, that's the convention I have chosen. So you have to multiply by this I. Okay. If you want to compute loop level S matrix, loop level S matrix. In general, it requires LSZ. Okay. But as I said, in theory with high amount of supersymmetry, certainly not in bosonic string theory that we are discussing, but in theory with high amount of supersymmetry, where these 
two point function the self energy uh, corrections vanish okay there again this directly gives the amplitude the, the s matrix ia gives the s matrix okay? but in general you have to go through this lsd procedure to extract the s matrix from uh, this expression okay now we are not going to derive this formula okay we will not derive this formula okay you can in a sense you can take that as a definition of string theory right what string amplitudes are okay even though there is some kind of derivation that one can give starting from the original polyacop path integral okay. but we'll test various we'll check various consistency conditions okay. to do that we have to we need a crucial identity that this omega satisfies <clears throat> and this in fact is derived using cft properties okay it doesn't require anything else but let me write down the identity okay. the identity goes as follows you remember minus 1 to the v1 basically is 1 if v1 is grassman even and it's uh, uh, minus 1 if v1 is grassman odd okay which in turn depends on the ghost number of people. plus it goes all the way up to omega p gn v1 up to vn minus 1 QB VN, okay, and this has to be multiplied by minus 1 to the V1, minus 1 to the V2, up to minus 1 to the VN minus 1. Okay, because QB is less than odd, so as it goes past each, it picks up this minus 1 to the V factors. So this is given by minus 1 to the P D omega P minus 1. Okay. Now, at least you see the utility of using arbitrary p, because if you had only defined omega for 6g minus 6 plus 2, and then this relation will not make sense. Okay, So that's why it's useful to work with, uh, at least uh, introduce omega for arbitrary p. Okay, Even though eventually we are interested in integrating over a 6g minus 6 plus 2 n-dimensional subspace. Okay. Now, here one notation I should say this, what is qb v1? So qb v1. QBV of ZZ bar. Okay, so this is a local operator evaluated at ZZ, but this by definition okay, is integral over W sorry, integral. So this sort of this means it's integral, the integration contour is along around Z. Okay. So, if this is Z, basically we integrate the contour around encircling Z. Okay. That's the definition of QB. Okay. 
Okay. And you can easily convince yourself that if you take this, if you define QBV this way, then QBV on zero is nothing but QB on the state V. Okay, so this is the identity. Okay, as I said, it basically is derived using CFT properties. But let me just say what CFT property one uses. Okay, I have to go to the new, new slide, but I'll come back to the. So basically, one has to use the fact that QB of B is T. Okay, this is an identity, and then QB with B bar. Z bar is T bar Z bar. So this is the total energy momentum tensor, Tx plus Tbc. Okay. This I leave as an exercise. Okay. Given the definition of QB, you can prove this. Okay. So the way one proves this is that you take this sum of QBs, right, which are these QBs, QB contours around the Vs, you try to deform it on the Riemann surface. Okay. In that process, the definition of omega, okay, if you recall, has this Bs inserted. Okay. Has this B is inserted, so you pick up commutator of QB with this B, okay, and that uh, expresses the small b in terms of capital T. Okay. And finally, you have to use the fact that integral epsilon z t z d z this generates z goes to z plus epsilon z. Okay. So these uh, uh, transformations, okay, Z goes to Z plus Epsilon Z essentially moves you in the moduli space, right? That's why you see on the right-hand side, that is D. Okay. So D is D in, in PGN, right? That means it's actually moving in uh, either in the moduli space or it's changing the local coordinates. Okay. And it's doing this okay, by using the fact that this generates a change in coordinates, coordinate system. Okay. Anyway, this is just a sketch. Okay. But what all I want to emphasize is that this identity, okay, one can derive okay, very explicitly just using CFT properties, okay, using various identities in CFT. The other point I want to emphasize is that this integral, okay, the normalization, Okay, I have introduced this integral earlier also, okay, but let me just say the normalization okay, is that this integral is defined, is defined such that integral dz over z is one and integral dz bar over z bar is one. Okay, that's the normalization, so which means that these include the includes one over two pi i factor. Okay, so in the rest of today's lecture, I'll now show how we can use this identity, this identity to make some consistency checks. Are there questions? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I just have a, um, a question about the definition of the off-shell amplitude. Is, is it independent of the choice of the section? Does it depend choice of the section? Yes, indeed, it does. I'm going to, that, that's what I'm going to discuss next. Okay. Okay, thank you. So how does section dependence comes in? Okay, so let's look at the consequences. So first we study the dependence dependence on the section.
Okay, so let's draw this PGN. And let's suppose that we have made two different choices of this section. SGN and S prime GN. And we want to compute the difference. Okay, that if you evaluate the amplitude using SGN or S prime GN, what is the difference? Okay. So for this, we need to calculate integral over SGN of omega gn minus integral over s prime gn So this I can write, okay. so given these two sections, I can uh, find a uh, n plus one, six g minus six plus two n plus one dimensional subspace that fills the gap. Okay. This subspace is not unique in higher dimension. Here it looks like it's unique, but in general, if you have say in three dimension, two different curves, you can fill the space between the two different curves by in many different ways. Okay. So, but doesn't matter. Pick some one way to fill this gap. Okay, let's call this RGN. So this then I can write as integral over RGN of T omega GN six G minus six plus two N T one two P N. And then by using this identity, I see that this is given by integral RGN. I think there is a minus sign here, okay, because it's of this minus one to the P. Okay. So omega, omega GN, 6G minus 6 plus 2N plus 1. Q B B one B two two P N plus Omega G N yeah you have P one Q B V two V three two P N plus etc. Okay, there's a minus one to the Minus one to the P one, okay. and now we see that this okay, and I should also say the plus possibly boundary terms. Okay, I'll mention it earlier later. So this is zero if Q B V I equal to zero for every i. So if the external states are on shell, then the result doesn't depend on the choice of shell. Now on shell here doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be of the form C, C bar times dimension one on primary. Okay. It can be that plus any QB on something. Okay. As long as QB VI VI is at zero, okay, this different vanishes. So the on cell amplitudes do not depend on the choice of sex. Is this clear? Are there questions? Now I should just say here that this, I mean the way I have drawn this, right? I drew this RGN, but in general, that can also be a contribution from the boundaries of MGN. Okay. So this argument has to be supplemented. So this has to be supplemented by 
separate analysis of contribution from the boundary of MGN. Okay. It is the boundary of MGN because it goes on, but if the MGN has boundaries, okay, the boundaries of MGN are in fact precisely the degeneration points. Okay, where the Riemann surface splits up into uh, 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 other uh, two Riemann surfaces or some handle degenerates. So those have to be analyzed separately and one has to make sure that those boundary terms are not part. Okay. But this can be done in uh, a generic case. Okay, so this is the proof that on cell amplitudes do not depend on the sex. Off cell amplitudes do, but eventually, after you do LSD and you uh, extract the on-cell amplitude, again, you can show that uh, section dependence goes away. The second point that I want to discuss is the following, okay? And that's the decoupling of the unphysical states. So let's consider the following quantity. Okay, suppose the first entry is QB lambda, okay, which you had called pure gauge state. And then the others are V2, V3 up to Vn okay, with QB VI equal to zero for I equal to two to N. Okay, so what you're looking at is an amplitude where the first state is pure gauge, Okay, the rest of the states are physical. So this is, I can now write, this is the integral omega integral SGN omega GN But I can always add to this lambda QBV2 up to Vn minus one to root lambda plus the whole bunch of other terms because QBV2 is zero anyway, right? Because this is zero anyway. So you are just adding zeros. But once you have added these zeros, okay, we can apply the identity that we had derived. And this can now be written as integral over SGN B omega GN. Again, now you can see why we introduce omega for generic B, okay, because now this, are, this argument will become 6G minus 6 plus 2N minus 1. And this is again zero up to contributions from the boundary of the modular space, which have to be added, analyzed separately. Okay, this to be analyzed separately. And generically, these all vanish. So this shows that the pure gauge states decouple. And this, in a sense, is the proof of general coordinate invariance. and other gauge invariances, like the two-form gauge invariance. Okay. 
in the interacting theory. Okay, so it's not linear as general coordinate invariance anymore. It's the full general coordinate invariance in the nonlinear theory. Are there questions? Ashok, I think it would be useful if you could give uh, some examples of boundary of modular space, because probably some students are not so familiar with this concept. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, in fact, that will be, I mean, uh, a whole, uh, I mean, uh, at least one lecture of discussion the boundary of the modular space. Okay. But maybe I can just say what you, one means by the boundary of the modular space. It's basically this, you remember that if you take two spheres, okay, let's take simple, two, three punctured spheres, and identify, in fact, this, this will again come in the example that I was going to show. Okay. You identify W, W prime equal to minus Q. Okay. That gives a four punctured sphere. Okay. But the Q goes to zero limit is somewhat singular. Okay. Because you see, you are identifying these. And this corresponds to mod W equal to mod Q to the half. Okay. And this corresponds to mod W prime equal to mod Q to the half. Okay. So Q goes to zero limit. It's somewhat singular because this is basically saying that the two spheres are joining, but they're joining by a very, very narrow neck. So this is a boundary of the modular space. Boundary in this case of M04. And we'll work out the precise map next time. In fact, I think we have already seen part of this before. Okay. This we can also there's the reinterpretation of this okay. that if you take a plane with four punctures, okay, the boundary corresponds to when the two, two of the punctures come close. Okay. So if instead of having well separated punctures, if you have a picture like Okay, if these two punctures come close, okay, this you can show is precisely, this is precisely that Q goes to zero limit. Of the previous diagram. Okay. Next time we'll be applying this whole technology to clear sphere four point function, where I think all of this should become clear. Are there questions? Okay, so let me then say what we are going to do next time. Okay, but not uh, <coughs> say very much more. So this whole technology that we uh, described, okay, we are now going to apply on a very simple example. Okay, where you don't need so much technology, but nevertheless, it's good to see how it works in that simple example. Okay. So we'll apply this. To sphere four point function. Okay. Which is M zero four. G equal to zero number of punctures four. Okay. So this has 6G six G minus six plus two n, six G minus six plus two n. N is four, G is zero. So this is two dimensional modular space. Okay. 
Okay. And here you will be computing on cell amplitudes. So you don't worry about the local coordinates very much. Okay, nevertheless, you'll have to introduce the local coordinates. And we'll see how this goes, right? So the way we'll proceed is that we'll take the sphere with four punctures. We'll choose the four punctures over here. We'll draw the circles. Okay. So if you call this C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5, okay. and if we call this D1, D2, etc. D3, D4. Okay. And we call this the first sphere. Okay, this is our S1 and this is our S2. Then you see that we have the relation. Let me write down the relation and then I'll stop. So on C1, we have the relation Z1 equal to F1 of W1. Right, because the coordinate, okay, let me choose the contour, the rotation this way, the contour orientation this way. So Z1 equal to F1, W1, because Z1 is to the left, right? This, this coordinate system is Z1, inside is W1. So Z1 equal to F1, W1. On C2, Z1 equal to F1, sorry, F2, W2. So C3 will have Z2 equal to F3 of W3. C4 will have Z4 equal to F4, sorry, Z2 equal to F4 of W4. Okay. And finally on C5, we have, let's put the Z1 on the left. So it's like this, Z1, equal to F5 of Z2. Okay. And you have to introduce basically two parameters because you are trying to write, write two dimensional section, right? We will have to introduce two parameters here. Okay, we can put it in any way we like. Okay. But we'll see that the, the easiest to do this is that I'll, I'll choose F5 to be minus Q by Z2. Okay. And we'll choose these to be independent of Q. Otherwise, it doesn't, we'll leave this completely arbitrary. Yeah, at least for now. And then we are basically going to apply this whole machinery that we uh, develop to write down the amplitude for this four part function. Okay. And we'll see what we get. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Okay. And we'll continue next time on Monday. Okay. So if there are some quick questions, otherwise we can. So today there is a one more discussion session, so uh, we can also ask questions in, in, that, uh, in that occasion. Okay, so otherwise, hi, Ashok, thanks for the lecture. Okay, thank you.